As Sally Ride famously said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So today we're talking to Shasta Ways, founder of Dream Soar and the youngest woman to circumnavigate the globe in a single engine aircraft. Lately, we've really been hit by this concept that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. As the first civilian female pilot from Afghanistan, Shasta's mission was and continues to be to bring STEM education to girls globally. So if you've ever wondered what part you might play in helping to make the world a more fair and equitable place, our guest today has some ideas on how to do that. Shasta, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. We love Dream Soar and we're so inspired by your mission. For anyone out there who still hasn't heard, I wonder if you could take us back to the early days and give us some of your story. I was born in 1987 during a really critical time in Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, Afghanistan was at war with the Soviet Union. And luckily, my family was able to get out of Afghanistan, get out of that war environment and come as refugees to the United States. Uh, so I grew up uh, with me and my five sisters, um, kind of torn between two different cultures, the Afghani culture, which we experienced at home, and then I'd go to school and then I'd be exposed to the American culture. Uh, for me, I just held on to what I uh, was most comfortable with, and that was seeing my mom and my grandma and generations before them who were all housewives and who stayed at home. I thought that's my, my future, that's where my life is going to head to, and I was really happy with this idea. Growing up in, in Richmond, California, unfortunately, it was, a very, um, it was a very poor school district. I had a lot of substitute teachers. I couldn't take textbooks home, um, and that was my, my childhood. Eventually, my family did move out of Richmond to a city called Fairfield, which had a much better school district. Uh, that's when I started to think about the future, think about maybe even going to college. Um, I stumbled into aviation. I fell in love with it. And uh, at age 17, I decided I want to become a pilot. I want to learn how to fly. And I've never looked back since then. Wow. What a story. I mean, I think anybody who's facing any type of adversity could be inspired by that story. Take me from the idea to uh, the actual you know, implementation. I understand you had a mentor along the way, Jerry Mock. Um, how did your relationship with her help move this process along? So I had the privilege of meeting Jerry Mock about two years ago. I reached out to her family and got a response back from her grandson, Eddie, uh, who informed me that she was living uh, in the west coast of Florida and that she would love to meet me. Got into my car, it was a three hour drive, and the whole time I was thinking, well, what am I gonna share with Jerry? I, I was a little intimidated, to be honest, because she was such a fierce, strong, brave woman. Uh, so I pull up to her house, I, I um, get to her door, I knock, and here's Jerry, this five foot one, petite woman who opens the door, and she just invites me very warm and welcomely into her home. And to my surprise, she said, the first trip that I took after uh, completing uh, um, the journey of flying around the world solo in 1964 is that I went to Afghanistan. And for me, that opened the door to feel more comfortable, to share her who really I am, my background. And she believed in me. She said, you're going to do it. You're going to make history and you're going to fly around the world. I know it. And that um, opened up to a relationship that I had with her um, where Times were different, but the concept of, of flying a plane is pretty much the same, whether you do it in 1964 or in 2017. She really was the initial driving force for me to really take this seriously and, and to pursue flying around the world. How did you come up with the funds and the manpower to support you in such a big endeavor? It, it's my honest belief. If you have a really good heart with a good cause um, and you're genuine about what you want to do, people are going to react. 
I remember attending Oshkosh. Uh, it's called the EAA uh, Air Venture in Wisconsin, which is a huge aviation air show. The night before, I had printed 50 business proposals. It was just a lot of Googling on my own and, and figuring out what to put in a proposal. The minute that that air show, the gates opened and I got in, I mean, I was talking to everyone and just sharing this concept of flying around the world to inspire other young girls. I, I definitely had a lot of uh, discouraging responses, but also too, I had very motivating people who were just genuinely interested and said, here's my number. Uh, once you get the plane and your team together, give me a call. So it's important, whatever you decide to do in life, that you're really genuinely passionate about it. It'll give you the energy to get up and, and to talk to so many people and share your dream. That air show was, was huge for me. And this was about five years ago where I attended that air show. I eventually put together um, a team of people who all volunteers uh, contributed to the planning and the preparations of the flight. This concept that I had walking around at the air show turned into a nonprofit organization, Dream Soar. And from there, we have a, a very well seasoned board of directors, advisory council, dream team members who all came together, helped with the fundraising, helped with um, planning out the stops, the outreach events. You might not start with much in the beginning, but the more that you work towards your dream, the more that you'll see that things come together. Since I first found out about you, Shasta, I sort of learned more about women in aviation. And I discovered that there are only 450 female airline uh, captains worldwide. And only 6% of licensed pilots worldwide are women. Talk to me about the gender gap in aviation and what you think is causing it. So there is a really big gender gap in aviation. And uh, from my research, because I did a lot of studies during my master's program as to why women are not attracted to aviation, I think the biggest one is um, cost. It's, it's expensive to uh, invest your future into aviation, flight training, um, whether you want to get a degree behind your flight training or not. A second factor that I actually didn't realize until uh, much later is geographics. I come from a Middle Eastern um, background, and if my father were to have had a son, um, my family wouldn't have been able to financially support me because usually in the Middle Eastern cultures, the funds usually goes to the son because he carries out the family name. The third biggest factor is, is that there is a big lack of role models. Uh, even for me starting out, it was important for me to identify pilots who looked like me, who were like me, to give me proof that before I go down this road, um, Women before me have been successful, therefore I will be successful. How did you plan the route that you would follow around the world? So the route was ever changing, to be honest with you. And once I started to look into fuel, um, the capabilities of my small single engine Bonanza aircraft, I quickly had to narrow down that route and really identify which airports um, would provide customs, would provide the fuel that I needed, which was, uh, Abgas, 100 low lead fuel, and which airports would um, allow for a small single engine airplane to land in. The route that I had selected, uh, it, there was a lot of research, a lot of background, a lot of cold calls to these airports, uh, speaking with their managers, just kind of explaining why I'm flying around the world and why I'm flying into their particular airport. And even though, you know, I had a, a route set when I took off, um, that route changed with whether political news uh, made me change my route. You're kind of flying by the seat of your pants. Sometimes there are uh, times where you have to deviate from that flight plan. October 2017, you became the youngest woman to fly solo around the world um, in a single engine aircraft and amazing. So what, take me back. Um, what was it like you know, during that Pacific crossing? How did you feel? I, I think the... Um, more so than the Pacific, the Atlantic is more of the scarier ocean to cross simply because uh, the weather changes much quicker. Uh, you have harsher temperatures. Um, when you're up that north, you know, your airplane could be susceptible to icing. I mean, the Atlantic to me was more of the, the challenge. I remember once I got to my uh, halfway point across the Atlantic Ocean, my nerves started to, to come down a little bit. I started to feel a little bit more relaxed. 
And as I'm sitting there, I'm looking out, hoping that, you know, maybe I'll see a boat or a bird, you know, any sign of life. Um, and sure enough, I was really the only one out there. I had this moment while I was over the ocean where I thought, so in the history of aviation, there's only been seven women who have ever crossed this ocean in a single engine aircraft. And I would have never thought that the eighth woman would be this refugee from Afghanistan who grew up in a very underprivileged school district thinking that she was going to get married at a young age and that's all that life had to offer her. I didn't think that the eighth woman would be to fly around the world would be me. So it was kind of like this euphoric moment over the ocean. And you were the first from your country and really the first, right? The first uh, non-military um, female pilot, correct? From your country. That's correct. So when I started flight training, uh, again, we go back to role models in aviation. I had reached out to the Afghani government saying uh, that I'm looking to, to fly if they had kind of like a roster of past female pilots that I could contact and reach out to. And to my surprise, I got a response back saying that there had never been a certified female civilian pilot from, Af from Afghanistan. And if I were to continue to get my license, that, I, that they would acknowledge me to be the first uh, female civilian pilot from Afghanistan. And that's all I needed to hear. Uh, those words were encouraging. I thought I need to pave the way for uh, Middle Eastern women, women from Afghanistan, women from around the world, just to say you can come from a different background and still succeed in this industry. What an inspiration. I've seen some pictures of you in your jumpsuit. Uh, what did you have under that? Was it a survivor suit or a wetsuit? What, what, did, what did you have going on? I mean, it was like you said, it was cold. So for the Atlantic crossing, I did have to wear an immersion suit. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a gummy suit. It can save your life. It's, it's for safety. The flight suit was more for just, I guess, for show. Uh, but oftentimes when I'd fly, I'd dress really comfortable um, so that, you know, I could move around my very, very small cockpit. I also had a life raft on board. I had oxygen. So, uh, you know, and I test my oxygen before taking off and I take a picture of it. Everyone was like, wow, that's so scary. You have all these um, hose attached to your nose and this big oxygen tank. These were materials that I needed to be safe uh, to fly around the world. Who monitored you while you were in the air? And I'm just curious, you know, if you ever had trouble communicating. Uh, I actually did. Um, <clears throat> so we go back to the Atlantic Ocean crossing. I actually attempted to cross the Atlantic twice. Uh, so the, for the first time, I took off from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Here I am, I'm about 300 miles away from land. And I look over um, on my aircraft, there's uh, a, a system called the high frequency HF radio, which allows me to communicate with air traffic controllers over very remote areas of the world. It shears off of the aircraft, slams into the fuselage of the airplane, and it's just dangling. My heart sinks because I'm thinking, my goodness, this antenna could wrap around my control surfaces. It could, uh, the wind could push it towards the propeller. And, you know, I'm over the ocean. There's really nowhere to land. Uh, so I quickly turned around, and Honeywell, they had uh, installed a, a equipment on board the aircraft called the Airwave. And with the AeroWave, I had texting capabilities where I could <clears throat> text my team on the ground and just give them a heads up. Landed the aircraft safely. Mechanic came. I got back into the aircraft and flew to a different airport to get uh, maintenance help. Um, but our team consisted usually of, uh, of pilots. Um, you could visit dreamsore.org to kind of see a full list. Uh, but they were pretty much on standby just to make sure uh, nothing came up during the flight and uh, that I didn't need any sort of assistance when I landed. I heard that uh, the corporate aviation catering company, Air Culinaire, provided a special diet for you. What did that entail? So thank you. A special thank you to Air Culinaire. It's not like I could hand over the controls to another pilot. I was really worried about getting sick. Uh, and they put together a really nice menu for each stop where it was nutritious, it was healthy, and they knew that the food that they were going to serve me was healthy options and also safe to eat. Um, and to add to that, the business aviation community, even though I'm a general aviation aircraft, 
really stepped in and, and supported this flight wholeheartedly. We had several um, FBOs who usually manage business jets uh, cater to the Dream Store Global Flight and welcomed me and, and helped out with fuel and hangering the aircraft. Um, it was just incredible to see the business aviation community just kind of come together and uh, contribute to a greater cause. During the flight itself, how much rest did you take? Um, how did you make sure you got the rest that you needed? Um, were your hotels okay? How did that whole thing pan out? Um, I really kind of took it at my own pace and, and of course, mindful to the outreach planned events. I worked out at the hotels whenever I could. I really just had to shut everything off. Well, hydration was important. At some hotels, they didn't have laundry facilities or dry cleaning. It's just I kind of dove into the experience, just really appreciated which, uh, what each country provided. So oftentimes when I would get to an airport, I would see, um, a group of people waiting for me, sometimes with flowers, just welcoming me into their countries. And that helped a lot. We didn't experience anything just completely out of the ordinary. Um, and that, that was a big thanks to ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and all of the participating civil aviation authorities. Sometimes there would be reporters take pictures and then kind of head out from the airport uh, to the hotel to rest for the outreach events. Now that you've had this experience for a girl who's coming up and thinking she wants to be a pilot, what are some you know great ideas for jobs that she should sort of shoot for? So when I first got into aviation, um, I originally wanted to be an airline pilot. And once I started to take classes and really understood um, the airline industry, uh, I thought, you know, that's not the route that I want to go. And I was presented with, well, there's really three different boxes. There's a uh, corporate pilot, airline pilot, or military pilot. And I didn't see myself fit into any of these categories. So I created my own category, which was the founder and president of a nonprofit flying around the world to inspire the next generation. And that's something that I encourage um, the next generation to do is if you don't find a career where you're 100% passionate about, what's to stop you in making your own career? I mean, aviation is so dynamic and there's so much that you can do. So now that the flight around the world is complete, how are you continuing to work to accomplish your mission? And do you have something planned for the future? Uh, so one of the first steps that we're doing is we are going to be giving out scholarships to young girls and boys. Um, and it doesn't matter what part of the world they're from. These scholarships are geared to empower kids in their own communities to pursue STEM and aviation careers. I watched the video of you talking to these kids in the different you know, places around the world. And I have to say, I got, I got a little choked up. Other folks that I've shown it to got emotional as well. Are there any stories you'd like to tell about the people you met while flying around the world? You know, the one story that comes to mind, uh, in Greece, I went out to an orphanage. As I'm connecting with these kids, uh, I noticed that there was one girl kind of in the background, and she was very emotional. Uh, and it turns out that she was a refugee from Afghanistan who was separated from her family. At this orphanage, nobody knew how to speak Farsi, so no one really explained to her what was going on. I went to her, I kind of explained what was going on, why she wasn't with her mom, um, and opened her eyes to really take advantage of this orphanage, which had books for her to read, had um, friends that she could make. Uh, so that was one really emotional, very touching moment with these outreach events. The second um, situation that comes to mind was uh, for me going out to an orphanage again in India. And I recall one of the girls asking me, like, here you are flying around the world. You know, why are you here? Why are you uh, spending your time with us? You could you could be going out and traveling around India. At Dream Store, we're just going to, our next chapter is focus in on how we can really uh, empower these, these kids that uh, I've had the chance of meeting around the world. And if anybody wants to get involved with Dream Soar, where would you direct people and what can they do? So if you want to get involved, learn more, um, get in touch with our team, you can visit dreamsoar.org. 
We are a nonprofit organization. You can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We do have a fund for scholarships that we're, we're still uh, fundraising for. Empower a young girl uh, or boy around the world to, to pursue um, and elevate their career in aviation. Shasta, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation and you are an incredible human being. Um, I am so thrilled that we connected and I cannot wait to see what the future holds for you and for Dream Soar. Thank you, it was a pleasure. If you wanna get in touch with Shasta or get involved with Dream Soar, that website again is dreamsoar.org. She has a ton of interesting content and ways you can help with her mission. I guarantee you'll find something inspiring. I'd also be grateful if you could share this video with your friends, and I hope it inspires you to reach for your dreams. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.